you are at the Calvary Baptist Church. Our song is being played. Song Calvary. We play this song because that's our name. Calvary Baptist Church. You can find us on the web at calvarybaptistla.org. You can also find us on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, if you're interested in communicating with us, go through our website or through Facebook. We can respond to those two readily. Uh, YouTube is a little more difficult, but we can still respond to that if that's your only platform. As you know, we're going through the Bible uh, from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, we are now in the book of Leviticus. And if you desire to support this ministry, you certainly can by either mailing a check written to Calvary Baptist Church uh, at our address, 4911 West 59th Street. That's 59. Uh, that's Street 59, 59th Street, Los Angeles 9056. If you would like to give online, just hit the donate button on our website and you should be uh, able to give whatever the Lord lays on your heart. At this time, we're going to turn our attention to the Word of God. So I'm hoping that you've brought your swords. We're going to ask you to turn with us to the book of Leviticus. Amen. We're head to Leviticus and... Um, we have an obvious question. Leviticus is really all about worship. And um, when we think about worship, uh, there is a purpose. Now, we talked about worship by definition. And according to your input, worship is either a feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for God uh, feeling or expression of reverence and adoration in a religious experience, uh, divine action and human response, uh, or human action and a divine response. So these function uh, pretty well as our definitions. And we know that according to the book of Leviticus, um, our worship leader is the priest or the high priest or the priesthood. And, uh, and the priests come from the tribe of Levi. And in that tribe, we recognize that, uh, you know, the priesthood uh, is sort of uh, being developed from, from that particular tribe. None of the other tribes develop priests, just the tribe of Levi. And as a worship leader, the priest uh, functions kind of like the pastor of the church, um, or maybe even the praise leader in some capacity when it deals with singing, but when it deals with functionality, all inclusive, your, your, your senior pastor would be um, the example that best fits the high priest in the Old Testament. Now, when we think about uh, the price, we talked about there's a sacrifice. Uh, and if you have your worksheets, I'm just walking down our worksheet, uh, and there are those of you who've asked for copies to be mailed to you, and certainly uh, you should get them. If you haven't received them yet, you should get them uh, before this week is out. Um, but the, the price is a perfect and unblemished animal. And there were specific ones uh, that were mentioned. Uh, and according to our worksheets, we kind of laid those out for you. But uh, if you do not remember, uh, the, it could be a young bull, a lamb, a goat, a turtle dove, or a young pigeon. And these were generally used uh, as a burnt offering. And we explained all of that in the offerings and sacrifices of Israel. 
So now that we, we know, you know, it, you, you cannot bring a, a partially blemished or semi-blemished uh, animal uh, to be uh, given as a sacrifice and expect the Lord to honor it. You know that because in the story of uh, Cain and Abel, Abel gave the very best and Cain, Cain gave. There's a difference between giving and giving your best, Amen. right? So for instance, if you uh, say, I'm gonna pay my tithes at the end of the month after I pay my bills, <laughs> that's more like giving. Because uh, the first fruits mean you pay it off the top. Yes. You don't pay it on the back end, you know. Uh, and a lot of people do their giving so many different ways. Uh, the point of the matter is when you give with the right heart and the right attitude, that really is the, the uh, thing that determines whether or not you will have a blessed uh, experience because of giving, right? Because you can give at the beginning of the month and give with the wrong heart or wrong attitude, and guess what? That offering ain't going anywhere. And Cain was so upset behind the fact that Abel received more attention from God by his method of giving that Cain got jealous and eventually killed his brother. So giving with the right heart and the right attitude, right spirit is, is you know, we saw that already in Exodus before the tabernacle was built. God tells Moses, tell the people to give. And it's not that they didn't have it. They had it. Give with a pure heart, with a willing heart, and, uh, and God's tabernacle was not cheap. If you remember, uh, it cost in the, uh, certainly over, uh, probably about $70 million would be equivalent to today's uh, time uh, given what it cost back then, when you just amortize it, that's, that's, what it, that's what it amounts to, which means they left Egypt filthy rich. And the only reason they could do that because God blessed them in their going out, okay? So when we think about this perfect and unblemished, that means give God your best, and then God will give you his best. So you got the priest, you got the price. Now we're looking at the purpose. What is the purpose of worship? Um, and so the purpose is very clear. And we'll turn to Psalm 22 and 3. Let's just jump over to Psalm 22 and verse 3. And... Uh, it will lay out for us what is really going on. Psalm 22 and 3 reads this way, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. I'll read it again. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. So the purpose of worship is to get close to God. All right? right? To, to get close to God uh, or the opposite side of that same coin for God to get close to you. Mm. <laughs> now, uh, most of us are aware of what it is like to be in a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, most of us start off a relationship with some kind of a comment that we make to that person that is significant to us. Uh, the first conversation is probably uh, laughable, but uh, it, it really is designed to break the ice, right? So uh, many of us have heard uh, pickup lines <laughs> that, you know, we're good enough to get us to laugh or smile or something like that. So here are some familiar 
pickup lines. One of which is, uh, did it hurt? And, the, and so this is the guy speaking, right? Because usually those offering pickup lines are generally the guys. So the one is, did it hurt? And her response obviously would be, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean, did it hurt? Oh, when you fell from heaven, because <laughs> mm. you are an angel, right? So again, <laughs> oh, the ladies are rolling their eyes at me. Okay, but, but, but at some point, you know, <laughs> if that worked, <laughs> you might get her name. You got to do a little bit more work to get her phone number, right? Um, you, you know, you might have another statement of some sort where you're saying, um, I love that fragrance you're wearing. What, what is that fragrance? And that fragrance could, you know, be considered, you know, oh, I'm wearing Chanel or I'm wearing uh, this or that, right? And uh, the fact that you notice the fragrance might get a smile or something out of her. And again, the, the end result would be you might be able to converse long enough to get a, uh, you know, get beyond just uh, her name. So a pickup line is really a type of compliment that starts the conversation. Now, because worship includes adoration and, and uh, certainly reverence and love. You know, the true aspect of worship is complimenting God. That, that's how you're going to get close to him. And he's going to get close to you. Because I promise you this, all of us have had someone say something we didn't like before. Right? And that, what, pushed us away. Right? right? But then uh, all of us, I hope, have had someone say something nice to us which drew us closer. Right? So worship is really designed to draw God closer to us or draw us closer to God. So we say things like, Lord, you are my strength. You are my Savior, you are my God, you are my provider, you are my healer. We, we, we have a lot of things that we say to God, and then for whatever thing we say that he is, for instance, you are my healer, and I thank you for healing me, right? So we're drawing him in by complimenting him, yes. telling him how good a job he's done on our life. You saved my soul, right? I was on my way to hell, but thank you for saving me. I am now part of the family that you established that will have eternal life. I thank you so much because I know I was on my way to damnation boulevard, right? Um, so when we worship God, uh, we uh, draw ourselves close to him and he draws closer to us. Yes, we got a question. So, Pastor, that means that relationships, no matter if it's God and you or the two people or, or uh, you and a dog, um, that means that the uh, relationship is reciprocal, meaning that you give something and you more than likely expect something to be received back, right? Generally, uh, you, you, well, all relationships are two-way, two-way streets, right? right? So um, I don't want to use the term you expect it uh, because you're taking away someone's free will. Uh, the, you know, there are some relationships that are on one-way road <laughs> where one is doing more work than the other, yeah. but those relationships still work for whatever reason. 
So when we think about now what the, the priest or the senior pastor is doing, we go to Psalm 100. And Psalm 100 picks up where Psalm 22 and 3 uh, leaves off. And we're going to spend a little bit more time in Psalm, so you might want to just stay uh, in, in this book. All right, so when you come to church, right, because the worship center, the church house, the building, I'm not dealing with the fleshly tabernacle at this point. I'm dealing with when you get up and head your way to church, much like the question that was offered today. You know, relationships are reciprocal. There's, you give and you get, right? And uh, we look at reciprocal relationships similar to a tennis match. You know, the ball has to land in each court in order for there to be a match. If one keeps grand slamming and you can't even return the volley, right? Whether you're playing uh, volleyball, same, same thing. If everyone is, is, is slamming the ball down where you can't respond, uh, then there's really nothing reciprocal about the relationship because you keep slamming it versus volleying it so the other person got a chance to respond, right? So in this case, the uh, thing that we do when we come to worship, uh, the worship leader is, 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 is trying to direct traffic in this manner. So it says, make a joyful noise unto the who? Lord, Lord. right? Not, don't make a joyful noise to the deacon board. Don't make a <laughs> joyful noise to the trustees. Don't make a joyful noise to the mother's board or the deaconesses or the ushers for all that matter. You have to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Lord, right? Because the Lord is the one that saved you. Is that right? Yes. And this is a call to everybody, right? All ye lands. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all, all. ye lands, right? And the antithesis uh, is not what we come to church for. Make a complaint to the Lord. No. Make some murmurings to the Lord. Uh, make some backstabbing to the Lord. Do some backbiting uh, uh, to the Lord or uh, do some backsliding from the Lord, right? It's, it, there's a lot of stuff we do in the church. We make some cursing. <laughs> you know, some people don't even respect the church house anymore. Let's say a curse word in a minute. But, but, you know, the house of the Lord should be such that the only thing you want to come and do is make a joyful noise to the Lord, right? So now, you know, this is something that I know has happened because I've seen it and heard it with my own eyes and ears. I've seen people get in the pulpit and curse like a sailor. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not a behavior that is becoming of the Lord, right? I, I, I would be out of that church if I heard someone in the pulpit cussing like a sailor, and they're supposed to be my pastor. And, and, and I'm not saying that on that occasion where you get so mad that you slip. I'm talking about someone that does it as a matter of fact, like common behavior where they curse all the time. That is not what God wants a pastor to do, right? He wants that pastor to deal with this right here, this book. And I promise you, if there are, and when I say curse words, I'm not talking about the curses that are in the Bible where it says, uh, you are cursed because you did this, or you are cursed because you did that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking mm -hmm. about words that have derogatory connotation and meaning. Yes. Right? Okay. So we, we so the, we are to make a joyful noise, and cursing is not joyful, correct? correct? All right. So serve the Lord with gladness. Now, if the priest or the pastor is not glad when the pastor arrives at church to serve, uh, then how is anyone else going to get glad? Right? Uh, so we have to serve him with gladness, and a lot of us, unfortunately, when we serve the Lord, we serve out of obligation. And we get so tired that we complain about what we do. And I'll give you a couple examples because these are now archaic, but 
back in the day, the church clerk function was, you know, right next to the pastor. Real, realistically, that they were person, they were people who, you know, were the phone answerers. And if someone knocked on the door, they'd be the door answerer. And you have to answer with a smile on your face, whether you're answering the phone or you're answering the door. And you have to look presentable. You can't be in flip-flops if someone walks up. You got to be dressed, uh, you know, like you're expecting to meet someone, right? So uh, Daisy Dukes and flip-flops does not work for a church clerk right. when someone's going to knock on the door, right? <laughs> All right, so you have to be dressed appropriately. And to say, who's this when you call on the phone? That, that is not how... You answer a phone if you love the Lord and if you love the job that you do for him at your church. But what happens sometimes is we, we get so comfortable with the position that we lose the fervency with which we began that ministry maybe many years ago. And we start treating it like we, we're at home when... Someone calls you and you answer, who, who, who you calling? Uh, what, what, what's your problem? Uh, why are you on my phone? Get off my phone. You know, for someone to talk like that on the church's phone, they got to be fired immediately because that is not what God wants to see happening. Right? Right, right. So your decorum and your demeanor and your look all matter. Yeah. So you can't be a drunk answering the church phone and certainly a drunk answering the door at the church because the people are going to look at you and say that that's how everybody in church acts when it's just you. Right. So serve the Lord with gladness. So whatever we do, whether it's vacuuming the floor or wiping off a table or cleaning a mirror or serving a biscuit or preaching the word or singing a song, we do that with gladness. Right? Anytime you got a mad usher at the door, get him off the door. Yes. Because I don't want to see that when I walk in the church. A mad usher, you should have been here on time. Excuse me, you need to go have a seat, lady, because <laughs> you ain't serving the Lord with gladness. And uh, I remember visiting a church, and I'm sure it was Memphis, Tennessee. And as I walked in the door, I walk in as happy as I normally am, right? And I didn't know that they were, uh, you know, in between, they had two services, and uh, I'm in the vestibule, right? The service is in the sanctuary. And you all probably realize by now that I, I have no problem making a joyful noise wherever I go. There goes Shirley Swanson saying, hey! <laughs> She's going to kill me when she hears this. Uh, but anyway, um, be before I could get, and I always greet people. Hey, how you doing? It's good to see you. I'm glad to be in your presence. And before I can get my first sound out, <laughs> Now, I was invited to that church by someone that wanted me to meet their pastor. So I knew that that was not the pastor doing that. But I mean, it was over the top. Okay. Now, if I was not who I am, where, you know, I'm always turned all the way up and the knob is broke, right? So, so <laughs> some, some of y'all just turn the volume up a little bit. Somebody mess with you, you turn the volume off. You close, you close off your, you know, uh, your, your laptop of your environment and you go back to the car and you say, I'll go hang out in the hotel because that church is mean. Everybody, that wasn't everybody, that one person. So as I, t as I got a chance to meet the pastor, he was as congenial and nice. Everybody was great in that service except that one person at the door. Now, somebody should check people at the door. So your general president of the ushers board is his job not to, you know, to try to nurture the best out of you. And if you don't have the personality to handle the front, you need to be in the back. Don't be in the front seat when you're leading people out the front door. 
When they walk in, you want them to invite people to come in further, right? So serve the Lord with gladness is very important. So whatever you do, whether you're typing, answering the phones, accounting money, standing at the door, do it with gladness, right? And it starts really at the front of the church where the priest or the preacher, the pastor, he's got to be glad when he comes in. Now, most of you know that I, I, I used to have to tell people, don't talk to me until after service because a lot of times people would come with some pretty crazy things that they would say off the top of their head and that could make my spirit kind of uh, funny and I, I wouldn't know why I was in that mood until I thought about what happened the entire day. And the best thing I started doing is recording uh, my messages because I could critique what I saw. And there were times when I looked back at the video and I said, who was I mad at? Because it was obvious that I was mad before I got in that pulpit. So what I started doing was changing my prep. Instead of getting prepared just before I go in the pulpit, I get prepared as soon as I wake up in the morning. Like they say, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus, right? I'm singing and shouting with my mind, stayed on Jesus, right? You know, so I started doing my, my prep, you know, my consecration as soon as I woke up. Yes. And in fact, then I even went deeper. I start my consecration at 6 p.m. on Saturday. I start the day before. So after 6, don't mess with me <laughs> because I'm preparing for church. And, you know, for those who were around uh, maybe 15 years ago, you, see, you know there's a difference between back then and right now. Right? Those who were here, those who were not here, you don't have a frame of reference. Um, but serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Now, just because you're not in the choir doesn't mean that you can't sing. All of us have a song in our heart that God wants to hear us perform for him. You don't have to be the best singer in the world to sing unto the Lord, right? Because the point of the matter is you want God to get close to you and you want to get close to God, right? So, uh, come before his presence with singing. Verse three, no, right? This is cerebral, right? This is in your medulla oblongata, in your brain, in your bubble right here in between your ears, right? No, right? You gotta have knowledge, right? Know ye that the Lord, he is God, right? God of creation, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? God of salvation, you know, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, and it is he that hath made us, not we ourselves, right? He's going all the way back to Adam, right? He makes uh, him a little lower than the angels. That, that's humanity, right? What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? That's Psalm 8. He makes us a little lower than the angels, right? The angels are messengers of God, but we are the worshipers of God who superintend everything that God has placed on this earth, right? So what God did to Adam and Eve is he says, subdue it, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, right? You know, handle your business while on earth as worshipers. First and foremost, we are worshipers before we're anything else. Yes. He wants us to acknowledge who we are before him. And so as we are worshipers and doing our regular mundane things, we can still serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing, right? All right, so we are his people and the sheep of his pasture, meaning that we were called from darkness to light, right? We were called into the family of God 
from being orphans, right? We are now adopted into the family of God, and so we serve at his pleasure, right? And if we're in his pasture, he feeds us. He cares for us. He protects us, right? Even though people throw, you know, uh, things into our